Hello, hello, welcome to Quackalope. Thank you for being here. Today, we're talking about the White Lion, one of the quarry monsters and the first thing you experience in Kingdom Death Monster. And we're doing a little bit of a different type of video here. This isn't a how to play. This isn't entirely a strategy guide. It's kind of a hybrid of a few of those elements. And honestly, this is an experiment that I'd love your feedback on. You see, I would like to do breakdowns, profile breakdowns of every single element of Kingdom Death. That's what I'm working through at the moment. The White Lion is the one that I have played the most, and so I think most people are there. And so it seemed like an appropriate place to start talking and start experimenting with this format. But what I would love from you is down in the comment section down below, the Antelope and then the Butcher, the Kingsman, those are what I'm going to be doing next. What would you like me to do when it comes to the structure of these videos? What is interesting to explore? What mechanics maybe matter the most to you as I go through these systems? At the moment, my plan is to do an overview and then a hybrid or deep dive into the three core systems of the game. So we'll start with a general breakdown of the white line, what you can expect, what you'll experience when you're first getting into this game, the way it interacts, and some more surface level conversation points. That will, for the most part, avoid the majority of spoilers. That being said, if you are brand new to Kingdom Death, I recommend you play that prologue before ever watching this or any other video. Now, with that out of the way, we'll start with surface level. Then I want to break into the three core systems. We're going to talk about the showdown. We're going to do a deep dive into the structure of the AI deck, the way it's going to react and interact with you. We're going to dip into the hit locations, talk about what you can expect when it comes to not exactly probability, I'm not a math, but just more my general sense, the way that I'm thinking through what I might be able to do during this fight. And then we're going to talk about the resources you can collect. From that point, we're going to go to the settlement phase. We're going to talk about the Catarium and talk about the way these resources pair with your overall game strategy. What items can you get from this and how might they interact in, you know, the future stages of this game? And then lastly, we're going to talk about the hunt effects or the things that can happen to you over the course of this, uh, of this story. I'm saving that for the last because out of everything, I think that's the thing I'd like to spoil the least. So if you're staying tuned for that, it means you've already dipped into Kingdom Death a bit, you've already played through the White Lion, and you're interested to hear me talking about the lore, the systems, and the results or the possible impact of some of these hunt, uh, you know, some of these hunt events. Um, I'd recommend if you've only ever played the prologue or you're, you're dipping into it, gauge how much of this video you watch based off of how, how far you want to go into ruining or spoiling elements of this game. There's one argument to be made that understanding the strategy, especially after your first few playthroughs, helps you get farther and see more of it, and there's a lot here that I'm not covering. And there's another argument to be made that the charm and you know, the thrill of this game is in discovering something new. Um, this video is going to be an odd balance of both of those. Now, there are two things I want to point out before we swing into this. Uh, first off, hit that subscribe button down below if you're brand new to my channel. Like I said, this is the first in a series of Kingdom Death content um, that I'm going to be bringing to the channel here. And so I would love for you to, uh, to engage with us and to be part of this conversation. This is all ramping up for whenever you know, we get to the expansions or whenever that, uh, that gambler's chest arrives, because I guarantee you, hopefully I'll have this system perfected so I can do all of this around that behemoth of a box. The other note is going to be, if you want more Kingdom Death in the quality and presentation that we provide, there's going to be two ways for you to get more of what we're doing. Uh, first off is going to be over on our Patreon community. I already have, uh, some, some Kingdom Death custom uh, you know, writing and lore over there. Along with that, this exact same day, I have an older video that I just finished filming, uh, or just finished editing through. It was about an eight to 10 hour edit. Uh, our first, our very first four player showdown with the Giga Lion. Um, so if you're interested to see us bumble through the rules and, uh, and, uh, and do our very best to deal with this creature, um, please swing over there and do that. Along with that, I'm going to be doing a building and a painting video sometime this week over on the Patreon as well. 
So I have a lot of content coming to the channel for Kingdom Death. I have even more content coming to the Patreon that'll never be available publicly. Uh, the other way, we have a podcast up and running. Link is in the description down below. Uh, this podcast is about the board game world as a whole, but something you might be interested in is uh, our next episode on Tuesday is going to be based around Kingdom Death and specifically based around that prologue uh, first experience you have with Kingdom Death. So if you want to hear us dive into the prologue story and, and our journey into this space, uh, we'd love for you to swing over there and check that out as well. The other two things I must acknowledge before I finally start diving into this is going to be I'm not touching on the Beast of Sorrows here, the uh, legendary White Lion variant. Uh, and I'm not going to be touching on the Giga Lion either. If I touch on those, I'll do those as separate self-contained videos. My primary focus here is going to be on predominantly the level 1 White Lion, with a dip into the things that change with the level 2 and the level 3 as you progress through the game. But my thought is the more information I can give you early game, the more you can grow and develop as a player as you build towards late game, right? Because you're going to be 30 or 40 hours in before you're ever facing off with a few of those variants. So, I think, I think we're ready to get started, and this wouldn't be a Quackalope video if we didn't start somewhere towards the beginning with just a little bit of flavor text. There was once a beast that wanted to feel how soft its fur was. Since it could not reach its own back, it killed many other creatures and spent time rubbing its paws over them. They say that when the monster finally killed a human, it fell in love with their soft hair and its paws grew into a pair of fine human hands. The White Lion is the predominant predator in the Holy Lands, a realm that we don't have too much information about. We know that the great game hunters come from there and sometimes have uh, trained or imbued these to be their... Um, to be their aides as they scour the landscape. Our first encounter with the White Lion is going to be in that initial showdown, that prologue. We wake up from the earth, right? Wiping ink from our eyes and, and clinging to whatever light and darkness we have around us. And then suddenly a creature from the middle of the black reaches out with its very human-shaped hands with claws extended and rakes us across our body, starts tearing us limb from limb. That is going to be where we find and where we first experience the White Lion. The White Lion is going to act and interact as you would expect most cat-like creatures to do. It will focus on uh, mass destruction and obliteration of a single target, trying to knock you down, isolate you, uh, grab you, and run away to get as far away from everyone else as possible while it rips out your throat and tears you limb from limb. And then it'll refocus its efforts and return to do the deed to the other people here on the board. At the start of the prologue, you're going to have a few scripted elements of the White Lion. You're always going to have Claw on top, and you're always going to have Strange Hand uh, immediately on top of the hit location deck. Now, that's important because it's how the game teaches you how to play, but this, if this is the second time you're playing, there's some strategy you can employ when you're facing off against these two elements. You know how the White Lion is going to start interacting with you, so you can begin by predicting, feigning, throwing a founding stone, ripping off the hand, gaining some strength. There's some strategy you can do there. As you progress through the White Lions, you're going to begin moving into level 1, 2, and 3. The first few quarries that you hunt will likely be the level 1 White Lion. The level 1 White Lion is going to have a total hit point value of 11. The level 2 will be 16. And the level 3, the level 3 is going to be 22 total potential hit points, along with their custom-built AI deck and personalities. Here with the level 1 White Lion, you're always going to start within a triangle or a diamond shape six spaces away from that center point. You're also always going to have two pieces of tall grass terrain on the board. There's also a strategy you can employ in terms of placing and positioning that tall grass. Because tall grass is going to provide you evasion, placing them on zones where you are within a legal distance of the white lion, but also with that first hit, that first strike, you're hiding in the grass or preparing to engage as purposefully as you can. 
if you win, if you're victorious against the White Lion, you're going to gain a variety of different resources. There is a lot of resources that specifically tie to early game buffs. Things like the Whisker Harp, the Cat Eye Circlet, the Frenzy Drink. These are going to be items that really can set the foundation for your strategy moving forward and can be game changers when it comes to the way that you approach future quarry monsters. If you lose against the White Lion, the consequences, other than potentially losing some survivors, are not honestly that severe. He will take a piece of jewelry, a trinket, to add to, uh, to his monument to himself. If, uh, if that's the case, you have the chance of losing some nice pieces of gear, but the reality is it's definitely not as consequential as some of your later game quarry monsters. This is going to be not only the learning, the tutorial monster, it's also going to be one that rewards with quite a few special hit locations that provide you extra resources and extra modifiers. It's going to give you a good return on investment when it comes to gear. The White Lion is a creature that will grow with you as you play the game. The personality will change slightly, the opportunities for interacting, but, but in a 30-year Lantern campaign, I wouldn't say it'd be unreasonable to say you're doing 10, maybe 12 hunts specifically with the White Lion more if your strategy dictates it and if you really need some specific items or resources that you're hunting for. So as you're approaching the White Lion, whether it's in the prologue or post-prologue uh, with a level one or two, some of the things you should be thinking about. The White Lion is going to try to isolate you and pull you away from the hunting party. So getting him and corralling him into a corner could be a strategic way to face off. Also, utilizing the fact that you're always going to have these evasion buffs here on the board with the tall grass is an excellent way to either keep someone hidden uh, or, more specifically, allow and mediate some of the negative dice rolls you're going to be getting as the White Lion attacks. It's going to have some really powerful attacks. As you're leveling up, as you're approaching higher level White Lions, you want to try to get Encourage onto your game board. The reason being is that with the White Lion, you being down on the ground will trigger some horrifying AI deck cards. And if you are able to be grabbed and mauled, there's a chance that could be the end of your survivor. So getting up at the right moment throughout the course of the game uh, could be very important not only for getting hits on the White Lion, but also preventing him from targeting and, uh, and absolutely destroying you. Now, right now I have this set up so we're spread apart just a bit. Typically, I would actually try to position this grass within the range so that we're each on the same side. The reason I would do that is because you want to keep your hunting partner close and you know the White Lion's going to attack first, so if it pulls around, you've already exposed its blind spot to the other people who are playing. Uh, in terms of attacking, in terms of positioning on the white line, and we'll see this when we start digging into the AI deck, you're going to want to focus on the blind spots. There's a significant benefit to hitting from that point, and then also on the outer flanks. The white lion is going to have some abilities that cause it, or some reactions that cause it to charge forward and potentially grab people in its path, or at least bowl them over. And so fighting in these four predominant corners, as far as I'm concerned, is going to be where you're going to want to stay. Usually positioning one person front and center to take the crux of the blow, right? Distract and occupy the white lion's attention while you position and coordinate around him. Usually, again, that person should try to remain or position themselves within that tall grass location. So that's the... Uh, that's my sense of a general overview of the White Lion. I think at this point, I really need to start digging into some specifics. So I'll set this book over and to the side just a little bit. And let's go ahead and start talking about the White Lion's personality. Let's start here with the basic information. It's standard action and what those modifiers are going to do. So when it comes to a White Lion, you're going to be building a custom AI deck. A level 1 White Lion is not going to have any traits or moods, but as you get to level 2, you'll have Cunning. And level 3 is going to have Cunning, Merciless, and Indomitable, which we'll just go through in, uh, in just a bit. Which we'll go through in just a bit. The basic action for a White Lion is going to always target the closest survivor in the field of view, meaning not in the blind spot, but anywhere else on the map. If there's no target, he'll do his side action or a secondary action, which is going to be Sniff. A basic attack is always going to be two speed, so two dice, hitting on a two plus, which is pretty darn powerful, for a damage of one, which honestly, 
isn't that big of a deal until you get hit multiple times, you can usually take at least a few attacks from this creature if you need to. Uh, when it comes to Sniff, the instinct that it has, the White Lion sniffs the air and ends its turn. Until the end of the next round, all survivors are now threats, despite any effects that say otherwise. When a level 3 White Lion performs Sniff, it gains plus one accuracy token. So Sniff is going to be a situation where no one is currently a threat, uh, and the White Lion needs to be able to identify someone to attack on the very next round. That's all that's going to do. It's going to make it so that anyone, anywhere, could be a legitimate target based on the AI tracking system. Now, let's start talking about the AI deck, and let's start here with Claw. This is going to be the first card that you ever encounter when it comes to the White Lion specifically. Claw. Pick target. Closest threat facing in range. So, again, this is going to be the closest threat facing, which is going to be an outer triangle directly in front of the white lion in range, meaning the white lion with whatever his movement is for a uh, level one white lion that is going to be a movement of six, that's who he's going to target. Then closest threat in field of view, which is the wider periphery, and then no target sniff, meaning anyone in the blind spot would then become a target. Move and attack, speed two, accuracy two, damage one. And I'm not going to go through every single one of these cards in terms of the entire stats of them, but I want to talk about how they're employed, what they'll actually do. So, when you're building out your AI deck for the White Lion, the uh, level 1 White Lion is going to have 7 basic cards, the level 2 and level 3 are going to have 10, which will be all but 2 of these basic AI cards, so you can be pretty confident you're going to see at least a majority of these whenever you face off. We have Vicious Claw. Vicious Claw is going to apply Bleed, uh, and is going to be modified if the White Lion has lost its hand. We have Chomp. Chomp is going to focus on the closest threat, and this is always going to hit the head location. So this is something that is specifically targeting and doing its very best to kill you. We have Combo Claw. Combo Claw is going to be an attack that's going to deal a significant amount of damage and is going to start chaining abilities. So first you're going to target, roll, attack, has an accuracy of 4+. plus. Here's the problem. If this attack deals damage more than once, you're going to draw another AI card. Um, that's a big deal because cycling through and potentially having him knock you down and then grab you and drag you away, that's what that card's trying to do. Power Swat. This is going to be uh, a powerful blow from the White Lion, which is going to throw someone off balance. If you get hit by this, you're going to suffer knockback 6. The target is moved six spaces in a straight line directly away from the monster. So again, he's shoving you backwards, isolating you, and potentially going after you if the AI deck stacks correctly. Size up. This is going to intimidate a target, uh, and this is going to put you on the ground. That is one of the things that the white line really wants to do. It wants to get you knocked down. Because if it draws the right card after it has you down on the ground, you're going to be destroyed. Revenge. Revenge is an interesting one. This one's going to target the last survivor who wounded the White Lion in range. So he's coming after whoever just caused him trouble. Uh, after damage, the White Lion is going to isolate its prey, full move the White Lion away from all threats. Target suffers grab. Grab. Place the target knocked down in front of the monster. Target suffers one damage per monster level. So this is not only doing a bit of extra damage, it's not only thematically targeting whoever was just recently there fighting him, potentially your strongest figure, but then if it is successful, if it hits, this is going to be doing exactly what I'm talking about, isolating and pulling away from the rest of the hunting party, and with and with a base movement of, uh, of six and up, it's going to be hard to chase this creature down without a dash. We have Grasp. Grasp is going to focus on the closest knockdown survivor in range. This is where some of these cards are going to start getting nasty. This is going to be a speed 1, accuracy 2, damage 1, and after damage. The White Lion isolates its prey. Full move the White Lion away from all threats. Target suffers grab. Again, instead of focusing on the initial opponent last time, here we're focusing on whoever is potentially vulnerable. We have Size Up. Random threat in field of view. No target, sniff. This is going to intimidate a target. Uh, if this triggers, you're going to uh, roll a die and potentially get knocked down. Bat around, closest threat facing in range. After damage, the monster playfully bats the survivor around. They suffer brain damage equal to the monster's level. He's having fun with you. 
is toying with you a little bit, just like a cat would. Grasp. Again, this is going to be that other card that we just went through. Another AI card uh, here in the deck. There's going to be two of them that is focused on isolating and pulling away a survivor that was just knocked down. And another Claw, which is the first one that we started with. Again, fairly basic action, um, but a nasty, one to, uh, a nasty one to come across. Now, as you start building out your uh, White Lion deck, you're also going to be mixing in some advanced cards. With the level one White Lion, you're going to have three of these cards included. A level two, you're going to have five. And a level three, you're going to have nine, which I believe is in fact going to be all of them. This is going to introduce some moods and traits to the White Lion that um, can, be, can be significantly crippling. Along with that, we're also going to introduce a brand new trait to a level two. So let's go through what we might have in a level one, two, or three with these advanced cards. And then let's talk about the traits that start scaling as we increase in level with the White Lion. Starting here first, Terrifying Roar. This is going to target all non-deaf survivors. It's gonna let out a bellow. If the roll is higher than your insanity, everyone is going to be thrown backwards and away like you're all scrambling for help. And then the White Lion is going to perform a basic action on the farthest survivor away again isolating, identifying, and going after um, going after whatever target is the most vulnerable. Next, we're going to have Maul. Now, this is one of the nastier cards in the deck. This is the one that I was referencing. Uh, victim of Grab last round. Remember, in that basic deck, we had a few cards that specified and targeted Grab, along with some of these hit locations. Uh, they're going to resolve that same ability. Here's the issue. This is going to be a speed two, so two dice, accuracy two plus, hitting pretty easily, damage of three. And this can be included in a basic level one white lion that is massive. That is enough to entirely slaughter one person in a single sequence of AI. Uh, so that's, that's one of the big things you're gonna be paying attention for. Bloody Claw, closest survivor with the most bleeding tokens. This is gonna focus on killing you a secondary way. Bleed usually isn't a big deal with the White Lion, but it certainly can build and chain if you find that you're surviving a lot of those uh, kind of some of those critical hits. If you're rolling on the uh, if you're rolling on the severe injury chart, uh, this is going to give you minus one survival and bleed two uh, when you when you get hit by it successfully. And then finally, we have Smart Cat. Reveal the top ten. Uh, AI cards one card at a time and put the first two mood cards revealed into play then shuffle the deck So that's where we get to mood cards mood cards are still going to be advanced level cards um, And there's going to be four of them available in the base here We're going to have alert ground fighting enraged and bloodthirsty as you get Higher and higher levels of white lions You're going to find that they're trying to get these moods out onto the board because these moods are going to significantly change the way you're interacting with them. And due to things like ground fighting, you're gonna wanna set yourself up with a little bit of ranged, especially when you're going into later game or, or later sequence white lion fights. Those bone darts early on might be, might be a good purchase. Uh, starting here with alert. When the survivor moves into a space with the zone of death, stop their movement. They gain priority target token, discard alert and perform a basic action. Now, the basic action isn't too severe. We've already went through that, but here's the thing that, that this does. This is going to trigger an attack, control the White Lion's movement, and give you priority targets. So whatever you're drawing up next, whoever's moving into this zone is gonna get hit. And there's almost, there's almost no way to avoid this. Now, there is the option that when the monster is knocked down, uh, you can discard alert. The odds of getting a successfully knocked down creature are low, but there are some cards in here that do resolve that way. So maybe throwing a founding stone or using your bone darts early on to see if you're able to get that, if you're able to get a perfect crit, uh, that could be a good way to modify this. We have ground fighting. This is another mood. The monster flops onto its side, waiting for attackers to draw near. While ground fighting is in play, do not draw AI. This is an interesting one. If you have a Canthus down on the board, if you want to reposition, get into the perfect sequence, this basically gives you free reign to do it. The White Lion doesn't care what you're doing. He's just leaning back, relaxing, looking around, and waiting for you to come deal with him. If you move into the zone of death, 
uh, you're going to get a basic action with plus two speed, plus one damage, targeting the survivor. That is a lot. That little bit of buff there could tear you apart. When the white lion is wounded, discard ground fighting. So, that's where these bone darts or these ranged weapons are going to come into play. Don't make someone vulnerable. Instead, position them outside of the board. Go do whatever else you want to do. Uh, you know, rolling on a corpse or picking things up from the ground. And then throw your bone darts and see if you can get a wound. Or continue throwing your bone darts until you successfully get a wound. Because uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you stumble into this, it's going to be a bad time. Enraged. When this comes into play, draw an AI card. Bad, already sequencing, already causing more things to happen. While Enraged is in play, the White Lion gains plus one damage token per monster level. Uh, that is a lot. Even a level one with plus one damage token is going to be doing a significant amount of damage. And then you mix in things like Maul into this combination. And the reality is, I mean, you're, you're asking to be slaughtered. Uh, you need to try to deal with this. When a survivor suffers any dismembered severe injury or is killed, discard enraged. That is not a good way to deal with this card. Now, there are going to be some modifiers like controlling the AI deck a little bit or using the Whisker Harp to cycle out and, uh, and remove enraged, but it is something to... It's definitely something to pay attention to. You should be aware that this is possible, and if this comes out, you should do everything you can to kill the cat quickly. Uh, don't worry about harvesting resources or anything like that. And then lastly, we're going to have blood, Bloodthirsty here. When this comes into play, draw an AI. Again, sequencing, pulling more AI cards, not very fun. When a survivor suffers damage for any reason, place one token on Bloodthirsty. He is smelling the iron in the soil. Uh, at the start of each monster's turn, if Bloodthirsty has three plus tokens on it, remove all tokens and perform a basic action. Again, multiple actions from this cat, it's going to all start pairing together. It wants to hit you, knock you down, draw maul, pull you away, and then rip you apart. If it pulls the right sequence of cards, that is totally possible for it to do. So, those are going to be the potential moods that you have in the advanced stack of cards here. And we have one last advanced card I want to go over. This might potentially be the most terrifying card to see pull up on top of the deck, maybe potentially outside of maul. We have Lick Wounds. Lick Wounds is going to be the system that allows the White Lion to recover its own HP. If the monster has no wounds in the wound stack, discard with Lick Wounds and draw an AI. But if it does have wounds, full move the White Lion directly away from all survivors, running away, turn to face the closest survivor, and heal one. So he is running away, hiding his blind spot, and recovering, recovering another AI card. Now because in Kingdom Death, your AI deck is the White Lion's health. You're pulling something back in. If you just got rid of Maul, you could be pulling that back into the shuffle or a mood that you'd strategically discarded. Again, this is going to start chaining and this is going to be a terrible card to have. And here's the real reason why. Return Lick Wounds to the top of the monster's AI deck. If you don't deal with this immediately, if you can't cordon him off and shut down what's happening, the White Lion could potentially recover all, if not the vast majority, of the wounds you've done, turning a level 1 with 11 total hits that you need to do into, like, equivalent of a level 2 or level 3 if he recovers enough of his health. When we see this come out, this is one of those situations where we consider throwing a Founding Stone, or we utilize everything we have to deal a hit and to cause damage to this white line, whether that is dashing forward, using a ranged weapon, um, whatever it takes, because recovering health, especially that cycle on top of the AI deck, is really, really nasty. So we've been through the basic AI cards. Let's start getting into some of the more advanced things. As you go up to a level two white lion, you're going to have a trait come into play. This is going to be a standard thing that just exists because the white lion's a little bit older, a little bit bigger, a little bit more equipped for this environment. This card here is going to be Cunning. At the end of each monster's turn, the monster ex extends its claws. If there are any adjacent survivors, uh, target one at random and full move the white lion directly away from all threats. The target suffers grab. So a level two white lion, you're going to want some dash, you're going to want some surge, you're going to want encourage, you're going to want a lot of things. This, this white lion 
at level two will always reach out its claws trying to grab, isolate, and pull you away from everyone else. Again, pairing with and just maximizing the impact of some of these lower on cards. I hope you're starting to see how this sequences or plays out. The way this AI deck system works is built around chaining those things. Now, does it always happen? No, because it's random and it's drawn up. But is there a design here that's built around maximizing the impact of things like grab and things like knockdown? Absolutely, and you'd be foolish for ignoring it. Now, with a level 3 White Lion, we're going to introduce two legendary cards and also three special cards or special trait cards. Cunning is going to be the same, and we're going to be pulling in Merciless and Indomitable. Now, Indomitable is going to be one that I know a lot of people mistake when they first go through. This is a basic or a standard trait card. So, it's not going to be in your White Lion deck. Instead, it's going to be in your standard Munster basic card decks. Uh, but this is going to be added in. So, let's go through how this modifies a level 3. First off, Merciless, Trait. Archive, Beast Paw, Strange Hand, and Straining Neck from the Munster's Hit Location deck. These are going to be cards that either give you a powerful buff or, potentially, with Straining Neck, allow you to do a one-shot kill. Well, a three-shot kill, I suppose. Always treat all survivors as threats, despite any effects that say otherwise. Double all damage inflicted by grab. So, that, uh, it's a nasty card to have in play. The White Lion is too smart to allow you to take advantage of some of its earlier weaknesses. And then Indomitable. Whenever the monster attacks or is attacked, it stands at the end of that attack. Disgusting. So, Knockdown doesn't have, you know. The monster will not stand if a survivor is attacking a minion or another monster. If a survivor attacks during another survivor's attack, the knockdown survivor, the knockdown monster will stand at the end of the new attack. So you could potentially knock it down, surge, rush in, attack with someone else, complete the other attack, but then it would stand up in that flow, right? Because there is a sequence of flows, and as you play Kingdom Death, you'll learn what that means more and more. But basically, these two new traits are going to focus on, uh, you know, reducing the vulnerability of the White Lion and also making it so that vulnerable positions like being knocked down cannot be taken advantage of. And then we have uh, Golden Eyes and Vanish. These are going to be two legendary cards. So let's dig into them. Uh, Golden Eyes, Trait. The White Lion gains plus one speed and plus two accuracy tokens. When a survivor attacks the monster, they suffer three brain damage unless they are in the monster's blind spot. It is always looking at you with its gaze. A survivor with six plus understanding may ignore this brain damage by adverting their eyes. If they do, they suffer minus four accuracy when attacking. So close your eyes and try your best. If a monster is killed with the golden eyes in play, up to two survivors may consume the eyes. Each gains plus one permanent accuracy. Harder to kill. But if you can, if you can pull this at the right moment, what a cool, what a cool boon. And then we have, uh, and then we have Vanish. Vanish is one of those cards I don't mind leaving a mystery. Just know that this will potentially trigger some other game story events, specifically uh, pulling in a, uh, a storybook element called Zero Presence. So, just, uh, just a note there. So that's going to be a breakdown of the AI. Let's talk very briefly about these hit locations. In the White Lion deck, you're going to have the Glorious Main, which is the only impervious location, meaning you cannot strike and hit it, but if you get a critical wound, you will get some resource from it. And most of these cards, if not, yeah, the vast majority of these cards will have critical wound potential on them. Uh, so, something to pay attention to if you're trying to farm or harvest resources, the White Lion's one that especially early game you might be able to min-max just a little bit. Uh, we're also going to have um, a total of three, four, five, six, seven cards that have a consequence for the permanent wound. So, if you do a crit on these locations, there is a chance to get a, an extra bonus or affect the AI deck in some way, chopping off a hand or, or ripping through a shoulder that will affect how the White Lion is going to be acting and interacting with you. We have the Strange Hand. The Strange Hand is going to be the first AI card that you come across 
in uh, in your journey with the White Lion. It'll always be on the top of the prologue deck. If you hit the White Lion uh, and do a crit, meaning you throw your Founding Stone or whatever other way you can, you're going to get uh, a Persistent Injury, which is a Lost Hand, uh, and you're going to spend one Survival to gain plus one Permanent Strength. This early on in the campaign is something we always consistently do. Uh, that plus one permanent strength is just a great way to start off the sequence. Good way to start building a fist and tooth mastery. Um, which gives you gives you a little bit of confidence early on. Not that, you know, in a game like this, you need it. We have the Beast's Paw, which is going to have a broken foot consequence and rip off one Lion Claw for you. We have the Beast's Heal, which is going to knock down the White Lion and is going to have a persistent injury, the Ruptured Tendon. We have the Soft Belly, which is going to start a persistent injury called the Organ Trail, where he can step on his own guts and do damage to himself, along with one random White Lion resource. We have the Fuzzy Groin. Uh, here is one where you can rip off the Lion Testes if you get a crit. Uh, however, this persistent injury will have a negative side effect. The White Lion is going to hunt you down. You gain the uh, priority target token until you are dead or the White Lion is dead. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He is going to try to murder you. We also have the Beast's Temple. Here, if you crit on this, you're going to do a permanent effect to the White Lion. Uh, it's a persistent injury that makes the White Lion potentially miss his AI deck cycle. You draw up, roll a die, if it's a one or two, you discard it. Um, that is really, really good. And then we have the Beast's Maw. Uh, the Beast's Maw, this is going to be another potential persistent injury. Uh, this is going to be no job. This will affect some AI cards and could result in the White Lion vomiting on you and uh, giving you a insanity churn or potentially giving you an AI sequence where you can take advantage of the fact that the White Lion's just puking blood. Uh, not, uh, not too bad. Along with that, this card here could potentially give you plus one courage and plus one survival. Um, gaining courage, the survival boost is good, but gaining courage uh, is going to be a thing that you want to be purposeful about throughout the course of this game. Now, outside of that, uh, I believe still the majority, if not all, of these other hit location cards are going to have critical wound effects. Yeah, so the opportunity for crits on the White Lion is extremely high. Um, really, the only thing that's going to stop you is going to be the Clever Ploy or the Trap card that's in the deck. And there's only one of those. Now, in these cards, one of them that I think stands out to me is going to be the Straining Neck. This is going to be a critical wound where if you roll two D10s in a row, uh, you're going to crush the White Lion's windpipe and potentially get an immediate kill, um, which I think is just beautiful. Uh, as far as this deck goes as well, you'll find a lot of the failure reactions deal with uh, doing a basic action and potentially adding a little bit of damage to that basic action. We also have a whole sequence of failures um, that will result in the White Lion rushing forward. Again, grabbing whoever's in its path uh, and pouncing, you know, four spaces ahead of him. So if you're not fighting on the flanks, if you're fighting directly in front of the White Lion, it is going to be the most vulnerable spot for a, uh, a reaction to actually uh, take you down. Outside of that, the deck is primarily going to focus around getting crits, gaining some resources, doing some permanent effects or permanent damage, um, and pulling whatever benefit you can from this, uh, from this deck. Now, like I said, in the White Lion's deck, there's going to be one trap card. That trap card is going to be the Clever Ploy. Uh, trap cards halt everything that's happening, and when you pull it out, you're going to have to resolve it. You are not able to escape from them either. Reshuffle the hit location deck. The attacker is caught in the White Lion's ruse and is savagely mauled. The attacker is doomed. Perform basic action, target the attacker. Doomed. You may not spend survival until this card is resolved. Trap Reminder Rules. A trap card cancels the attacker's hits and ends their attack. When a trap is drawn, a knockdown monster will stand. After a trap is performed, reshuffle all hit location cards, including this trap card. So it's just going to be a basic attack. Not too bad, but it is going to halt everything. It is something you want to pay attention to, and getting hit when you're, uh, when you're vulnerable, when you're reaching out for an attack, uh, could still be a big deal. So, after you've defeated the White Lion, after you've ripped it to shreds, let's talk about the resources you can get. Outside of basic resources, your leather, your hide, your organ, everything like that, you're also going to be pulling a mix of other resources. We have the Lion Claw, 
the Eye of the Cat, the Shimmering Maid, the Golden Whiskers, the Sinew, Lion Testes, uh, the White Fur, the Great Cat Bones, the Curious Hand, and the Lion Tail. The most important ones you want to be paying attention to is going to be the Sinew, the Golden Whiskers, the Eye of Cat, and potentially those Lion Claws. Now, the main will give you a headdress later on in the game, but really what we're hunting for when we first play this game is going to be those four core resources. The uh, Cat Eye Circlet, the Bow, the uh, Harp, and the Lion Cat Guitars. We'll go through what that means and what those items are in just a bit, but if you pull any of the, those resources, I would highly recommend strategically holding on to them until you successfully defeat a second white lion. When you first successfully defeat a second white lion after the prologue, you're going to be drawing the Catarium. This is where you start building gear specifically uh, based around the white lion itself and the resources and gear grids that you're able to collect from the white lion. So let me pop this open and let's, uh, let's start talking about what white lion items you're actually going to be adding to your collection. Here at the Catarium, you're going to have three basic groupings of items. The White Lion Armor Set, which will provide you some uh, in-game abilities if you're able to complete it. The weapons that you can get, and then the game modifiers, the things that give you more control over the game. Let's start by breaking down the White Lion Armor Set. In order to complete the White Lion Armor Set, you're going to have to be crafting a White Lion Helm, Gauntlets, Coat, Skirt, and Boots. Now, with this, you're going to be focused on white fur uh, and a great cat bone. So, pairing those together, this is going to cost 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 total resources in order to complete and wrap it up. And here's what, you'll, what it'll give you. You're going to add one extra defense to each of those locations. We'll go through what that means here in just a bit. And also, your weapons are your claws. You're going to gain plus one speed and plus two strength when attacking with daggers or katars. Now, the White Lion is going to have some daggers in its gear grid. It's also going to have some Lion Cat katars, which can pair together. This is going to be an armor set that works really well if you want a, a character that's rolling a ton of dice. Now, strategically, that is not always the best option but it can be a fun way to experiment and play. The reason that can be a bad option is because you're sequencing and cycling through the hit location decks a lot quicker, right? If you get multiple hits and you're pulling five or six cards, there's a chance or a higher chance that you're gonna be pulling that, uh, you're gonna be pulling that trap card. But the good side of it is your probability, your odds of success oftentimes do go higher with more dice rolls. So the chance of getting a hit and have it being a successful hit or having it being a crit hit uh, that also adjusts based off of your speed. And with the bonus of strength, the chance of doing significant damage is going to increase. Now, when you're building your uh, White Lion armor, there's a lot of modifiers here, and I'm not going to go through every single one, right? I want to give as much of an overview as I can. Their average defense is going to be two for each location, so pretty good. A little bit, little bit above the rawhide armor set, although you should probably have one of those completed by the time you're crafting this. They're going to pair, to pair together with some red and blue connection points. The white lion boots could increase your movement by one. The white lion gauntlets could modify what is called a pounce ability and give you plus one accuracy for your next attack. Here's the key. The white lion coat, if, uh, if this is enabled, you're going to be able to do an ability called Pounce. Spend your movement and activation. Move three spaces in a straight line. Then if you move three spaces, activate a melee weapon with plus one strength. So this is, you're doing everything you can. You're going ba 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 ba, moving, and then activating. And if you have the gauntlets, you're gonna get another bonus from that. You're gonna get plus one accuracy, and if you have the, uh, the entire armor and you're attacking with guitars, you're gonna get plus one speed and you're gonna get plus two strength. There's a lot of items in this deck. There's a lot of items in this gear grid that start pairing together and start making one very powerful, very high dice rolling attack. So that's gonna be the overview on the armor set that you're getting. Let's talk about the weapons a little bit. Here on the uh, Catarium, you're going to have the option of building a cat thing knife, cat gut bow, the lion beast guitar, 
the claw head arrow and the king's spear. This will be one of the first times you're able to do some of these longer ranged items. The king's spear, for instance, is going to have a reach of two, so you can poke a little bit farther, you can actually attack from a diagonal position. The lion beast katars, these are fun. They have deadly. Uh, plus one luck with this weapon, and they can pair together, meaning you can hold and use two of them at the same time. Meaning you could hold them and use two of them at the same time. When you attack, uh, add the speed of the second Lion Beast Guitar to your gear grid. So here, if I had the Lion Beast Guitars, I had both of them, I would be attacking with a speed of four, accuracy seven plus, damage potential three, and then if I had the full white line armor, I'm talking a speed of six. You're rolling so many dice, you don't know what to do with yourself. Uh, down here, we're going to have the cat gut bow. This is going to be the first bow in the game. And one of the things that I always try to go for, having ranged, having, having a character that can be balancing some upkeep along with firing down a line is going to be really, really valuable. And oftentimes I try to get this to replace the uh, to replace the the throwing stones or whatever you get at the very beginning, the cat gut bow. This is going to be cumbersome and ranged. Uh, cumbersome means you have to use both your movement and your attack or your activation in order to use this. But if you're staying in a single position or potentially getting up up on top of a great of a giant stone face, that's not too big of a deal, especially because it has range of six. So you can hit a solid quarter of this board from most positions that you'd be in. Now, along with that, you're going to be able to do a modifier called Aim. When you attack before rolling a hit, you may reduce the speed of this weapon by one to gain plus two accuracy for that attack. I usually utilize that. Guaranteeing a hit, a precision hit, is oftentimes for me better odds than rolling multiple dice. My dice rolling skills are just, uh, are just not the most effective. Now, you could also build the Claw Head Arrow. This is going to have slow... It's going to be ammo, and it's going to be ammo for your bow. You must have a bow in your gear grid to activate this. If you hit a monster, the monster is going to gain minus one evasion token. You can use it once per showdown, so when you use this, you'll flip it over. Well, you'll leave it on, but just remember that you already utilized it. This is going to change the, uh, change the damage and accuracy of your cat gut bro for a single attack, but it's going to add a modifier here. It's going to be one speed, hitting on a six plus, for a potential damage of six and above. That's significant. I mean, that is, um, it, that I have missed with it, but it is few and far between when I miss with it. And then finally, the, uh, the last modifiers we have here, the supplemental stuff, the stuff that starts changing the core systems of the game, the cat eye circlet, the frenzied drink, and the whiskered harp. The Whiskered Harp is going to be one of those things that you might not want to take out with you because noisy items can have consequences on hunt events, but the Whiskered Harp is going to give you uh, a plus one survival on arrival to the showdown, and you can do your best to strum and reduce a mood. On a six plus, you're going to remo reduce or remove one mood currently in play. With some of the Nemesis monsters, and even with the White Lion here at more advanced levels, it can be really helpful to have on hand. Uh, the Frenzy Drink. The Frenzy Drink is something that a friend of mine almost always wants to get, and I find it pretty risky. Uh, if you consume this, you're going to suffer the Frenzy Brain Trauma. It can be used once per showdown. The Frenzy Brain Trauma is going to make it so you're not using survival anymore, uh, but instead you get a strength and I believe a speed buff. So instead of using the thing that's keeping you alive, you're just going all out, making yourself vulnerable, but also hitting and tearing apart the creature that you're facing off against. And then probably one of the most uh, interesting and important items in early game Kingdom Death, uh, or at least potentially. Again, any of these are legitimate. There's just strategies that have been built around what might work best as you're growing. The Cat Eye Circlet. Reveal the next three hit, uh, the next three monster hit locations and put them back in any order. Guarantee, as you're digging through this deck, that you can either target what you want, like a final blow location or the strange hand, for instance, to throw a founding stone, or you can do your best to avoid those trap cards. That is going to be extremely valuable and extremely important. Um, especially as you get to more creatures that have more consequences in their hit location deck. 
building and perfecting and knowing what's coming could be worth a full player's turn. Um, could be the difference between life and death. So why did I say you should hang on to the Sinew, Golden Whiskers, Cat Eye, and the Lion Claw? Well, it's because of the things that I went over here. Some of the important items here are going to require those to be built. Uh, the Lion Beast Katars are going to be one Lion Claw and one Hide. The Claw Head Arrow is going to be one Lion Claw. The uh, King Spear is also going to require a Lion Claw. The Cat Gut Bow is going to be Sinew and Bone. The Cat Fang Knife is not going to be something you're able to get early on. Instead, you're going to need an Elder Cat Tooth to get this, which is going to be a rare special item. So this is a much late game. This is a much more later game item. Cat Eye Circlet is going to be one Eye of Cat. And the Whisper Harp is going to be uh, one Golden Whiskers and one Bone. So these items are not only harder to get, but also important for building out your character deck. For instance, the Whiskers and the, uh, the Eye of the Cat, there's only one of them on every White Lion you face. The Sinew, there's going to be two, and the Claws, there's going to be three. Now, if you're only drawing up four, you're getting some basic resources as well. That, uh, that could be a big be a big difference you don't want to have to go out hunting i mean there's been multiple times where i've went out hunting a white lion again specifically because i didn't have um it didn't have sinew or i didn't have the eye of the cat yet so a little bit of a decision point there the final thing i want to go through here it's been a longer video than i intended but hopefully you're finding it interesting the final thing I want to go through here is going to be our hunt events. What could potentially happen to you as you're going off to face off against the White Lion? Now, I'm not going to address some of the things that can happen when you're facing off against the Antelope. Um, any of you that know the context for that, you'll know what I'm talking about. We'll get into that when we touch into the Antelope. But let's go through these, uh, let's go through these potential hunt events. Um, and then we'll, I think we'll call this a video. And I'll ask you, I'll ask you how I did and I'll ask you for... Uh, advice as I prepare for the next one. Scratching grounds. Uh, white lion hunt event. Claw marks scar the ground. The survivors may choose to investigate. Each survivor that investigates gain plus one courage and rolls on the table. Courage is valuable. That might be something you want to do. Now, the potential consequences here. You could uh, gain the lion claw. Nothing could happen. Or you could take one event damage to your arm. It's not, you know... Courage for a little bit of damage early on. Really not a bad trade-off, and you need to know that this is going to be a place where you can pull courage. Lion in heat. The darkness is filled with an unearthly screeching and yowling. Huddled together, the survivors close their eyes but cannot sleep. All survivors suffer one brain event damage. Having a little bit of insanity when you go out could be beneficial. Now, you're not going to trigger on the disorder chart uh, if, you, if your brain breaks. Um, but knowing, you know, knowing that could be good to have at least a little bit of armor there. Prowling Lion. While the survivors stalk the White Lion, the monster hunts something else. Move the White Lion one space away from the survivors on the hunt board in pursuit of its prey. The White Lion starts the showdown with ground fighting in play. Build its AI deck normally. So, in this case, White Lion's pushing away from you. If this is a level 2, that means it might be able to actually uh, work its way beyond Overwhelming Darkness. If this is a level 3, that means it is going to be inching itself closer to uh, Starvation, the end of the board there. A level 1, usually this isn't that consequential. However, ground fighting is. If the White Lion starts with ground fighting in play, remember, he's going to wait for you to approach. This is where ranged items become really, really valuable. So, that is a thing that can happen. Marked Territory. The White Lion has marked this area. If any survivor has plus three understanding, they realize the area is covered in ammonia. If they have not innovated it yet, the survivor settlement gains plus ammonia innovation. This is one of the only, not the only, but this is one of the few locations, especially during a hunt event, where you can actually gain an innovation through this journey. So if you haven't innovated ammonia yet and you know you're going to be hunting the White Lion multiple times, Bring someone else, someone out that has three understanding and, uh, and do your best to pull this. Getting that without spending the resources or spending the endeavor in order to do it, um, really valuable. Uh, sea of Golden Grass. Fields of Golden Grass lay ahead. The event revealer may choose to avoid the plains and roll twice on the hunt event table. 
before moving onto the hunt board. Otherwise, each survivor gains plus one courage and the event revealer rolls on the table. So again, courage, early game, big buff, being able to uh, to unlock some of those modifiers. Like this is, I normally, all, I, I normally always go for that courage pool. Uh, rolling on the event table, that's even, oftentimes I find that to be more risky than just the consequences here. Uh, consequences, one through three, you'll be ambushed, meaning he's gonna go twice at the very start of the showdown. Four through seven, you're still gonna roll on the hunt event table, not too big of a deal. You trade one, one for one for courage. And then eight through 10, uh, you're going to uh, move the light, white line one space backwards on the hunt event board, meaning you're getting closer and closer to your prey. You work your way through the grass a little bit more efficiently. White lion cub. This is uh, one of the most interesting things that could happen. Uh, so, and here's, here's why. The survivors find a white lion cub. They may choose to slay the cub. If they do, each survivor gains one basic random resource. The event revealer rolls on the table below. This means that you're doubling your potential resource pool when it comes to basic resources from this hunt. Now there are consequences to that. Of course, slaughtering an innocent white lion cub is not always a good thing to do, except it is. I'm just sorry, the, the, four, the four resources, that is so valuable. And if you're already gonna have to fight a white lion no matter what, you might as well get as much of it, as much from it as you can. If you roll on this table, uh, one through three, uh, the mother is going to appear. She is going to start with enraged in play. You know, more damage. That's that card that pulled out that is uh, hard to get rid of unless someone is dismembered or killed. And it means, uh, means you're gonna have a much harder fight than you initially anticipated. Four through seven, the father lion shows up, begin the showdown immediately. Okay, early on, trigger the showdown, not too bad. And eight through 10, nothing happens. Lion sculpture. A crudely arranged effigy stands before the survivors, decorated with small metal trinkets, human fingers, and stuffed with dried tall grass. Their quarry sculpture confounds the survivors. Survivors gaze at the arrangement, attempting to glean the substance of the white lion's bizarre, bizarre inhuman intelligence. Each survivor gains plus one understanding and plus one insanity. Good pull, good initial pull. You're rolling on the hunt event board. You know, you got a little bit of randomness there, but plus one understanding and a little bit of brain armor. Really nice. Aromatic breeze. The hungry lion sniffs the survivor's musk on the wind. Move the white lion one space towards the survivors on the hunt board. If it moves into the survivor's space, the white lion's going to ambush you, meaning again, he's going to go twice at the very start. If the white lion ambushes the survivors, they skip their first turn. So, you know, the consequences to hunting the white lion, there's gonna be a decent amount of courage, there's gonna be the chance to get ammonia, you might be able to pull a ton of additional resources, uh, you're gonna have one opportunity for understanding, and you're gonna have the white lion shifting up and down, but if you already know you're fighting him, you know, the, the consequences for that cannot be that high. Now, again, those throwing daggers, uh, they could be really important, especially in the first sequence of this game after that prologue white lion. The reason being is if you pull ground fighting in this, uh, in this deck, if it is one of the events you've, uh, you've drawn, the dealing with a, a white, dealing with a lion that's just laying on the ground waiting for you to do something, um, that is a complicated position to be in. So I've, uh, I've been talking for a while. I feel like... I feel like this is I feel like this is a video. Hopefully it's been informative. Now I want to sit down and fight the white lion if I'm going to be honest. Um, if you made it to this point, give me feedback on what you'd like to see, what changes, how could how should this format be structured to provide the most value valuable information to you as I start going through everything else. Again, I want to do every single core game creature and then start getting into the expansions. I'm preparing for when that gambler chests and the next waves arrive. I fully intend to do full strategic and detailed breakdowns on what's going on here when the time comes. Over on the Patreon, like I said, we are going to be posting the first ever showdown I had with the Giga Lion, and I'm also going to be working on a building guide and a uh, you know an amateur painting guide for the White Lion. Just an opportunity to hang out, um, piece some things together, show off, uh, and, and have a moment to relax. I've really been wanting to 
to sit down and enjoy painting again. I've, I've, it's been slammed for time. And so I thought, uh, I thought I'd give it a swing. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Hopefully it's been informative. Hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully a lot of things. Um, if you want to see more of these, hit that subscribe button down below and take the time to share. Literally, if 10 of you who've watched to this point take the time to share on social media, on Facebook, or on any of your Kingdom Death groups, it will make a world of difference for this channel. Whatever you do, remember to do the important thing. Get out and play some games. And I'll see you next time. Thank you.